Thank you very much. Well, fellow patriots and corn huskers, good morning. <laughs> Great remarks by, uh, by my colleague Mike Johans. I feel constrained to sort of correct the record in one respect. Uh, Time Magazine's most 100 influential people. <clears throat> you need to know who some of the other people in that group were, like <laughs> Lady Gaga. <laughs> I had to ask my staff who is Lady Gaga, but in any event. <laughs> so uh, you have to read, uh, read a little bit more into that, maybe. Uh, Mike's uh, comments were just terrific, and uh, I'll have a little bit more to, uh, to say about uh, Mike's main message here this morning. But... It was great last night to visit with some of the young Republicans here, and uh, I thought I'd find out where everybody was from. I said, anybody from northeast Nebraska? And a couple hands went up, and I pointed to one fellow. I won't mention his name. I said, where are you from? He said, Oakland. <clears throat> so I thought I'd have a little fun. I said, well, uh, anybody famous born in Oakland, Nebraska? <laughs> and this is the truth. He said, well, he said, the first governor of Nebraska actually lived there for a while, but nope, nobody famous born in Nebraska. <laughs> and I said, well, I was born in Nebraska. And I got to thinking last night, what he should have come back with was, well, like I said, <laughs> you're not famous enough or I would have known you were born in Oakland, Nebraska. So uh, it's been great, though, to be back and uh, and just kind of remember some of the uh, great things that I did as a, as a child in uh, in Wayne primarily is where we lived, uh, delivering the Omaha World Herald when it was about five degrees above zero. That was a lot of fun. Um, those of you who uh, have uh, shoveled out the uh, livestock stalls after a long winter know how much fun that is. But uh, I told Deb Fisher when she came to uh, Washington that my father used to buy our uh, Hereford yearlings. Uh, I showed calves at 4-H, and, uh, and he bought our calves out at Ballantyne, Nebraska, and the ranch is out there. So I had a little familiarity with the Sand Hill country that she comes from. And I have to tell you that <clears throat> in addition to your three great congressmen, um, you're going to have a fantastic delegation adding Deb Fisher to the Senate to serve right along beside Mike Johan. You know, uh, Mike uh, talked about Nebraska values, and I really think there is something to that. Uh, the values that my grandparents and, and parents and aunts and uncles uh, infused in me, my father's family, immigrants from Holland, my mother's family, farmers, corn farmers. Um, I think those values are very real, and uh, I, I hope that I continue to embody them. I need to tell you about Mike Johans and what people in Washington think of him. You know him as your governor former secretary here, very knowledgeable about economic issues, about land and resource issues, agriculture, obviously. But the thing about Mike that, and, and I don't know of anybody that doesn't like Mike Johans. And the reason is because of his sincerity, his trust, uh, he is absolutely trustworthy. And when he speaks, and he's not one to speak often, like so many in Washington, people know they can rely upon what he says. He knows what he's talking about. And that is a value that I think maybe characterizes a lot of us from the Midwest. But it's something that Mike has brought back to Washington, and he has added to the Republican conference there dramatically because of his seriousness, his sincerity, and the fact that you can trust what he says. That's important because it's a tough world back in Washington. And I've gotten to know Deb a little bit. She's been back there, and she's made an incredible uh, impression on those of us uh, uh, whose help she is seeking. She obviously exudes the common sense, and also I would say the independence that comes from living on the land, uh, ranching, uh, having to be responsible for your own success, and not rely upon others, uh, in particular the United States government. So I think that kind of attitude that she brings back is going to serve her and the state of Nebraska and the United States in very good stead. And I know that you count it as among your first responsibilities to ensure that this fall you elect Deb Fisher to the United States Senate. Now, Jeff and Lee and Adrian obviously represent this state very, very well. You need to elect them, all of the, the, the slate up and down, uh, as well as ensure, as uh, Mike said, that the five electoral votes from Nebraska uh, help elect the next president of the United States, Mitt Romney. I 
I mentioned Mike Johans, but it is also true, as he said, that he is the junior senator in his family. And those of us in Washington very much appreciate the senior senator, Stephanie. I have something, uh, the, the shy, retiring Stephanie. Uh, those, uh, some of you may know that, that uh, Stephanie a actually has a rather colored past. Now, I'll have to explain that, I think. I happen to be a big NASCAR fan. And uh, how many of you knew that Stephanie actually drove stock cars on the dirt tracks here in Nebraska and announced the races? All right, there you go. Uh, to me, that makes her very real. And uh, uh, those of you, uh, I mean, everybody here I know knows Stephanie and knows what a great contribution she makes, not only to Mike's career, but in her own behalf. She is tremendous, and I love Stephanie. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you some questions this morning. Um, and the first one I'll, I'll, I'll give you a clue on. I was thinking how I mean, everybody here knows exactly what has to be done and why it has to be done. And the success of Republicans and conservatives in Nebraska demonstrates you know how to do that. So how could I convey the message in a little different way? And I thought, well, there's one thing that has happened in this country that's sort of a microcosm for all of the other problems. If you think about all of the reasons why it's important to replace the Obama administration and elect Republicans to control the House and Senate, there are a lot of different reasons, but they're all boiled up really in one piece of legislation called Obamacare. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about that. Here's the clue. When Obamacare was passed, the 60th vote was a senator from Nebraska, whose name does not have to be mentioned here. <laughs> when Obamacare is repealed, the 51st vote is going to be by Deb, Deb Fisher. Fisher. All right. <laughs> Always knew we Nebraskans were pretty smart. Well, that's what has to happen, because this legislation really embodies Everything that's wrong with the approach to government that this administration and Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi have brought to Washington. And let me just illustrate the, the, the point here. If you're talking about taxes, fiscal policy, bureaucracy, uh, crony capitalism, loss of freedom, every one of these things are, are embodied in this legislation. So I'm going to ask you some questions here, but let me set the, uh, set the stage first. Let's talk about them one by one. You now know thanks to the U.S. Supreme Court and things that have been discussed since, that this represents a massive tax increase. There are 21 different taxes, over half of which apply to middle-income people in the country, over $800 million overall, over 10 years. If you buy insurance, and by the way, you have to, that'll be taxed. If you have a wheelchair or an oxygen tank or some medical device, that's taxed. If you need anybody here use any pharmaceutical products, they're taxed. I want to ask about tanning salons, but they're taxed. You name it. I mean, it's like Ronald Reagan said, if it moves, their attitude in Washington is taxes. If it keeps moving, tax it again. If it stops, regulate it. That's the approach of Obamacare. It's going to be enormously expensive for the American people. And bear in mind, as Mike said, this is on top of what will then be the biggest tax increase in the history of the world, because on January 1st, automatically, if we don't do something about it, all of the IRS code, what's called the Bush tax cuts, but this is really code that's been in effect now for a decade, and it applies to all Americans, not wealthy, not poor, everybody. All of that goes away, and the rates in existence before then automatically take effect. And the effect of, of this on marginal income tax, on the top rate, a 13% increase. On, uh, the death tax would go up 29%. You know, your, your dad develops a business, small business. He passes away to the, uh, to the kids in the family. Their tax on that business is 45% as of January 1st, almost half of the value of the businesses. Now, how many businesses can afford to pay that? And then you get to capital gains would increase by nearly 59%. The tax on dividends would nearly triple. The bottom line here is that when added to the Obama care taxes, this tax increase on January 1st is going to cripple our country. In fact, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office said that when you combine it with the sequestration, which is going to take about a million jobs out of our economy by slashing defense spending as well as other spending, if we don't do something about that, we will be back in recession. 
we will be back in recession as of January 1st. That's the effect of this large tax increase. So my question is, does America need more massive tax increases? No. no. Message number one for President Obama. All right, how about the size and reach of bureaucracy? This is a whopper. 159 new programs and bureaucracies created by Obamacare. Now, they're being created all over the rest of government as well. But just think in this one 2,700-page bill, that's the result. And every one of these people have tremendous power. New powers to the Health and Human Services Secretary. Uh, new powers to independent boards. One is called IPAB, or the Independent, independent Payment Advisory Board. Do you know what IPAB does? IPAB is going to be the board of 15 unelected bureaucrats who decide what to reimburse the doctors and uh, hospitals and others for the care that they provide. And that, of course, is the power to decide not to reimburse anything. In other words, if you're too old, they'll decide you don't deserve certain kinds of treatment or benefits or pharmaceuticals or medical devices. In Britain, they have a similar body. It goes by the acronym NICE, N-I-C-E, but it's not NICE. And you've all heard the stories of what happens to folks in, in Great Britain. The government has a set amount of money to spend. It decides what kind of uh, cost-benefit ratio applies, particularly when people get to be above 60 or 65 years old. And if they can't afford it, you don't get it. That's what we're looking at in terms of rationing of health care out of Obamacare. And then you've got the, the other regulations, as I said, the uh, HHS secretary. It's a lot like other aspects of government, the Environmental Protection Agency. Was it the Department of Labor that was going to say kids can't work on the, on the farms anymore? I mean, as a kid, I would have liked that. But the reality is, it taught me a lot. And, uh, and I'm glad I learned those lessons. And, and the reality is that this massive new bureaucracy. Uh, well, let me ask you. Does America need a larger and more onerous federal bureaucracy? No. All right, good. I didn't think so. Hell no. All right. <laughs> That's the message we've got to convey. Now, talk about spending, weakening our fiscal position. This bill was actually sold on the grounds that it would reduce the deficit. Now, this is a laugher. $2.6 trillion in expenses, and it's going to reduce the deficit. This one doesn't pass the laugh test, and in fact, after you know, Nancy Pelosi said, well, we'll pass it and then find out what's in it. Well, since we did that, the nonpartisan people who score this in Washington said, no, it's going to add to the deficit. Obviously, people with common sense like Nebraskans understand that. Now, there are a lot of accounting tricks in here that suggest that they can make some savings, one of which is, and this is one that I, I just don't think we've, we've gotten enough information out on. Did you know that one of the reasons they could say that this doesn't cost as much is that they literally stole a half of a billion dollars, $500 million, excuse me, half a trillion dollars, $500 billion from Social Security, from the Medicare program, the Medicare program to fund Obamacare. And they did this primarily through the program of Medicare Advantage, but there are some others. They said they wouldn't take uh, uh, benefits away, they did. They say they wouldn't raid uh, Medicare. They did. $500 billion worth. Now, folks, that kind of accounting can, can show some kind of, uh, of benefit in terms of fiscal policy, but it's not real because uh, they also claim that that same amount of money will help to make the program more stable, which it will not, of course, do. You can't have it both ways. The bottom line is that this is an enormously expensive program. It's going to add to our fiscal woes. And I'll just say it this way. I don't think it was ever about deficit reduction. I don't even think it was about controlling health care costs because, as you know, again, according to uh, the nonpartisan uh, agencies in Washington that score these things, it turns out that health care costs are going up, not down. Uh, the average premium is something uh, like an increase of $2,400 a year. No, I don't think so. I think this was all about expanding government power in Washington, D.C., and creating a new middle-income entitlement program to get people hooked on yet one more government program so that they would have to rely upon the government for what they get out of life, and that would make them then more responsive to the politicians who want to grow government and promise those things to the American citizenry. I think that's what this was all about. And I think when you see the way the president talks about class warfare, it demonstrates the point. So let me ask you, 
Do you think America needs another unsustainable entitlement program? No. Hell no? Okay. Do I hear a, a hell no out of that? All right. All right. Fourth, crony capitalism. This administration was going to be transparent and unite us and all of that. They brought Chicago style, not just Chicago style politics, but Chicago style government. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours to Washington, D.C. And they're doing it with your money. And that is directly a part of Obamacare. Who were the big entities that wanted to support it? Well, it were those who thought that they would benefit from it. I'm not going to mention the names of the, uh, of the associations and so on. But when you're forced to buy their product, they see an advantage in this. And frankly, the president made a lot of deals in order to get this bill passed. But it turned out not to be such a, a, a great thing for the supporters. Just take labor unions, for example. Now, they're big supporters of the Democratic Party and of the president. Turns out that after they read the fine print, they didn't think this Obamacare was such a fine idea. So they said, could we be exempted from it? Kathleen Sebelius, Health and Human Services Secretary, said, sure, we'd be happy to exempt you. So she issued 1,700 <laughs> waivers from the provisions of Obamacare. Uh, I, that shows you two things. Number one, what a great idea Obamacare was, but secondly, how they still take care of their friends while doing the opposite to the folks that they don't care for. Armies of lobbyists, obviously, have been hired in order to derive the special benefits from this program. And as I said, the labor unions are, are probably the, uh, the most to benefit. But there's crony capitalism in here, too. And even though Republicans and conservatives understand the importance of defending our free enterprise system, we understand the difference between a real Adam Smith free enterprise system and the kind of mercantilist crony capitalism that comes out of the administrations of a lot of liberal, liberal Democrats. And that's what things like Obamacare promote. And you can go on down the line with other things as well. As I said, Obamacare is a microcosm. You can look at what would have happened with cap and trade. You can look at Solyndra and all of the kinds of energy subsidies, some of which, by the way, are spent in other countries like China. And you call the administration on it with the outsourcing of the money. And they say, well, the reason we had to send the money to China is because they're not building solar panels in the U.S., so we had to send it to China. Why? I mean, this is crazy. It's your money. And it shouldn't be going abroad, number one, and it shouldn't be going to favored groups of people. And it just happens that these are the people who also support the administration politically. So I ask you, does America need more cylinder style crony capitalism? No. No. I agree. And that's part of Obamacare. Well, final point, and I really think this is the most important of all, because all of these things in one way or another get back to a, a central theme. And that is taking more freedom from the American people. Taking more of your hard-earned money to be spent in Washington, regulating all of the businesses, and now we find also families and religious institutions, telling you what you can and cannot do, forcing you to buy a product for the first time. And by the way, just a little footnote here. It's unconstitutional for the government to make you buy a policy of insurance under the Commerce Clause. But it's apparently constitutional if the penalty that you pay for not doing it is a tax rather than a penalty. Go figure. It's still taking away your freedom by telling you that you have to do something. But there's something even worse than that. Worse than the economic freedom, I think, and equal to the diminution of religious freedom embodied in Obamacare. And that's the freedom to make the decisions that you think are best for your family. Now, after your liberty, what is the most important thing to everybody in this room? It's the health and happiness of your family. If uh, there were a few cells go cell phones going off a minute ago, if one of those phones went off and uh, the call on the other end was, your wife has just been in a bad accident, um, what's your first thought? Whatever I have to do, I'm going to take care of my wife. Whatever it costs, whatever I have to do. That's the attitude we have about our families and should. And so, to me, the most pernicious thing about something like Obamacare is that it takes away from us the right, the most fundamental right, to protect our families, to decide what we think is best between us and our doctor as to what kind of insurance we want, what kind of health care we want, and not have to rely upon some government board 
that tells us that we're too old for a particular procedure, or that a certain drug costs too much money for the government to be able to authorize its use. And make no mistake, even though this relates to Medicare, the reality is that Medicare sets the trend for all of the uh, health care coverage in the country because it drives the prices. All of the physicians here will tell you exactly that. Because there are not there is not adequate reimbursement under the Medicare system. There aren't going to be enough doctors to take care of us for whether we're in Medicaid, Medicare, veterans care, or through regular insurance. The reality is when the government gets involved here and begins setting the rules, every one of those rules in one way or another takes a little bit more of your freedom away. And I detected when the Tea Party movement really got going that this was the animating force behind it. Americans who cared and who were paying some attention but who hadn't been involved uh, enough to really get out there and make a difference realized that like the frog in the pot that's boiling but they just turned the temperature up a little bit, one degree you know, at a, at a time, you don't notice it. Well, they had finally gotten the message. They had finally noticed it. It's getting too hot in here. This government is taking too much freedom away from us in everything it does, whether it taxes us, it spends more money, whether it's the bureaucracy that regulates us more, or the laws that are passed that imposes new requirements on us. In all of these ways, the United States government no longer serves us. We're being asked to serve it. It's taking our freedom away, and we've got to stop it. And that is the message that every one of us I know here today believe and animates us to want to get out and ensure that at least in where we can have an influence, we can take our government back. And that starts with electing your congressional delegation, with electing Deb Fisher to join Mike uh, Johans in the United States Senate, electing Mitt Romney as our next president, and ensuring that we do everything else up and down the line to have conservative leadership in this country. Now, again, in closing, I know that my message is uh, to, to you, you all know very, very well. I just tried to put it in a little bit different package. But you answered the questions, and you answered them right and strongly. And you know what's at stake here. I also know that you know how to do your job. You wouldn't be here on a nice Saturday morning uh, talking about politics and the need to, to win the election this fall if you weren't absolutely committed to that and if you didn't know how to do it. But it's good to be reminded and to see great public servants like Mike Johans up here who are fighting this fight every day and appreciate just one more time the ways in which uh, this country uh, needs to serve you rather than having you serve it. I'm reminded of remarks that Theodore Roosevelt made. He loved the fight. You know, he said, a fight not enjoined is a fight not enjoyed. And he loved to get in and mix it up. But he, he was asked what he appreciated most about this country. And he said, the thing that I have benefited from most is the opportunity to work on work worth doing. My friends, if this isn't work worth doing, I don't know what it is. It is our challenge. This is our time. It's our future. And I thank you very much for joining in.